Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, whichever the case may be um, for all of you. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to attend this webinar. We've got a great story for you, and um, I'm excited to dive right in. So my name is David Potes, and I am part of the Solutions Architecture team at Amazon Web Services, and I'll be talking to you a little bit today. Um, we're also joined by Manesh Patel. Uh, he's a technical director at Qbull as well as by Seth Myers, a senior data scientist at Demandbase. And um, we're, we're all going to work together uh, to bring you a really interesting story. So um, today's agenda, um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, data lake solutions on AWS and uh, a quick overview of uh, kind of AWS's view of that. Uh, as well as an overview of the Cubal solutions featured in the story, um, so you have a good kind of base to understand um, uh, how they solve these challenges. Uh, the challenges faced by demand base and the success story, uh, because uh, this was actually a really, really successful implementation um, and solved a lot of uh, interesting problems um, for demand base. And uh, we'll wrap up with um, Q&A and discussion. So uh, without um, further ado, um, uh, I'd like to kind of jump into like what our learning objectives are today. So objectives is, you know, let's reduce management complexity. You know, analytics um, can uh, sometimes uh, have a lot of overhead on it. And we want to learn um, uh, good strategies to avoid this, uh, as well as um, reducing the cost of processing and analyzing data. Um, you know, everybody likes to save money, uh, myself included, and um, we've got some uh, uh, tips and approaches to be able to do that. Um, and you know, one of my favorites is how can you operate with a scale and efficiency of a, a very large enterprise, um, yet only have a small data team. Well, we're going to show you how. how. So um, uh, let's take a look and let's dive right into uh, kind of the introduction to data lake concepts. So uh, a, a lot of companies are, are, are really, you know, kind of taking this to heart and, you know, doing very ambitious projects to unlock the information in the data that they already have. Um, you know, companies have amassed, you know, just vast troves of data, whether large or small, um, but a lot of it's locked away um, uh, from, you know, being complementary to other data sets and um, often ends up in isolated data silos. So uh, how can we do that or, or how can we um, uh, unlock this value? Uh, well, uh, we've heard a lot about data lakes in the last couple of years, and it's a it's a newer architecture um, and, and increasingly popular. And the idea is that we've got an architecture here where we can analyze massive volumes of data, store it, uh, and often this data is what we call heterogeneous, meaning that um, it may come from different sources, it may have different types of structure, you know, it may have different lookup fields, and all of this kind of adds to the challenge. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of a data lake. You know, uh, obviously I'm already sold, um, but I'd like to share some of the cool stuff with you um, that we can do here. One question that companies often ask is, um, you know, why is the data in many locations and where is the single source of truth? And the solution that the data lake provides is, let's store all of our data in the same place um, and then analyze off of that rather than siloing things and things like operational data stores or, you know, a, a file systems, you know, different types of applications and different subsets of data um, landing in different places that has been transformed in different ways. So uh, it can be very challenging. Another question that we get asked a lot is, is really about the ingestion portion. You know, how can I collect the data quickly from the sources that, that emit it or produce it or are intermediate landing points and store it efficiently? And not only efficiently, but, you know, at the right price. And with the, the data lake um, uh, notion, um, we can quickly ingest data because we don't force it into a predefined schema. Uh, schema on read. Um, rather than schema on write, is one of the fundamental elements and, uh, frankly, features of a data lake architecture. And then, you know, uh, let's scale up, right? You know, a lot of these um, data sources are, are really, truly massive in terms of volume and variety and um, uh, the speed or velocity of the data. So one of the best ways that you can scale up efficiently is let's separate storage and com compute. 
um, so that we have uh, different dials and we can scale those separately. One of the biggest things is, you know, scheme on read, right? You know, so if I have different um, analytics and processing frameworks that I want to apply to the same data, um, I can do that because I haven't forced this data into a predefined schema. I'm open to schemas that um, maybe have not even been articulated yet. And I may have, you know, machine learning or AI tools that I want to run against this data. I have may have more kind of traditional BI runs, you know, or charts and graphs. Uh, and also, I want to make sure that um, my data scientists and even my business analysts can experiment with data and potentially fail fast. So the data lake uh, definitely enables that. One of the best things is you can do that in an ad hoc basis because we do the schema on read rather than write. So what's our approach to the, the data lake um, from the AWS standpoint? We've been working on this um, for a few years, uh, but I can tell you, you know, if you want the TLDR version, uh, S3 really is the data lake. And um, I like S3 as, you know, both a, a storage and a landing zone um, because of, uh, it has a couple of features. One, um, it inherently decouples storage and compute. Um, since S3 is an object-based storage, um, there's no kind of uh, elements around um, maintaining a cluster to manage that data. You know, at AWS, we believe in customer choice. So um, with the S3 data lake, uh, you have a lot of flexibility to use um, any of the tools in your ecosystem or all of the tools. And uh, it gives you the ability to identify the right tool for the job. Uh, and frankly, future-proofs you a little bit too, because you know, there's, there's, there's certainly tools out there that haven't kind of burst onto the scene yet. And um, you know, having this ability to smoothly encompass new tools um, really gives you an advantage over both your competitors and the market. So a couple of great features around S3 that I like to highlight uh, that um, reasons that it makes it such a great tool for the data lake. Um, and it's incredibly durable. So it's designed for 11 nines of durability, which is uh, 99 and then, you know, 0.99 nine times. Uh, so that's quite a few nines, uh, as well as designed for four nines of availability. Um, and, you know, if you use tools like uh, multi-part uploads or range gets, um, you can really get some, some blazing performance um, uh, out of this um, object-based storage. It's easy to use. Um, you know, we provide SDKs. Uh, we expose a REST API. Um, you can also do things around the CLI or, you know, if you're into tools like Terraform or you want to build things through Bodo toolkits, um, you have a range of options um, to manage this uh, as well as, you know, through the, the console. If you want to just click, click, go, um, you can get started that way as well. I can't really say infinite scalability, but dang, it's close. Um, you know, S3 is probably one of the most uh, scalable storage tools on the planet. Um, and really, you know, there's no, there's, there's no realistic limits, right? So as much as you need, uh, scale your compute independently um, and, you know, get started for as, as little or as much as you want to store. Um, and then, you know, uh, it's also integrated with some of the other data processing and storage tools that we have on AWS. So if you're into uh, a Hadoop ecosystem with our Elastic Map Reduce or you want to get things into a columnar data, data warehouse like Redshift, we have the ability to smoothly integrate that. With that, uh, I would like to hand off to Manesh, um, and he's going to talk to you about automating complex tasks um, with Kubel. Great. Thanks a lot, David. Yeah, really good stuff. And, you know, some of the concepts that David talked about are key as to why Kubel decided to do big data as a service and, and do this, you know, in the cloud. Okay, so first, a little bit about Kubel. Kubel was founded in 2011 by Ashish Jusu and Joydeep Sansarma. Prior to founding Kubel, Ashish and Joy were, had built the uh, big data platform at Facebook. And in doing so, you know, they, they found that data is only valuable if you can get it into the hands of users that can do something with it. Right? They came up you know, with this whole data, de de data democratization idea. And um, you know, one of the outcomes of that whole process was that they were the original authors of Apache Hive, right? the ability to um, get this data that was locked up in, in Hadoop into hands of users that knew SQL and the class of that users was huge. Anyways, long story short there, as they were working through that process, uh, they ultimately realized that 
you know, the, the cloud was a perfect environment for big data. Um, and again, going back to some of the points that David brought up with the separation of compute and storage, uh, the ability to easily scale uh, independently the storage vector and the uh, and the compute vector, and picking the right tool uh, for the right choice. All of those reasons are are why Cubol was founded. Before I dive in, um, I just wanted to pull the audience here and get an idea of you know what what is the status of your big data initiative. Um, what I'm curious for here is you know are you just getting started? You know do you potentially have a legacy? platform that you're looking to, um, you know, scale further or pick up, you know, the ability to do, do newer things, machine learning or data science aspects, or are you further along? So I just wanted to pull the audience and get an idea of, of where that stands. And, yeah, if you can make a selection, and then um, we can go ahead and proceed from there. Awesome. So I'm looking at some quick results. Uh, it seems like it's pretty mixed. Uh, I'm seeing folks are some, some percentage are, are deployed. Some are expanding, um, and then there's others on the other end of the uh, spectrum where they haven't deployed but are researching. So great stuff. Awesome. Thanks a lot for that. Big data is hard. It's really, really hard. But the uh, Gartner reported that you know, something around 70% of big data projects will fail by 2018. And they cited various reasons, right? Um, some of the key reasons include lack of you know, highly skilled technical folks in the industry. There's a high amount of confusion. And that's based on, you know, the, the large number of overlapping tool sets and also, you know, the fast-paced evolution of the tools that are out there. You know, you look at open source technologies, uh, things like Apache Spark um, alone going through, you know, seven or eight different versions in just the last two years. Right? So these are some of the reasons why this is this whole big prediction of uh, projects not being as successful as initially set out for. Wouldn't it be great if there was something out there, someone out there that could just make it all easier? That is the Cubo vision, right? And our vision and how we um, do that is basically we, we automate the big data platform, right? So we're, we orchestrate and automate that. Um, Cubo is a big data as a service provider. And in doing so, we help our customers improve their total cost of ownership at the same time, accelerating time to value. Talk a little bit more about what exactly Cubol is. Cubol, as I mentioned, is a big data as a service platform. It is a single platform for everything related to big data. Uh, what I mean by that is that, you know, it can be used by multiple persona, right? So uh, anyone who's who's interacting with the data. So not just the data engineering teams, but also data analysts, data scientists, and it's designed to work the way you do, right? And so we have various ways to access the platform whether that's programmatic interfaces using the APIs, um, you know, BI integrations, we have drivers. Um, we also have built-in um, UI for, you know, uh, running queries and that sort of stuff, but also interactive notebooks. Um, um, <clears throat> and it's used for a variety of different use cases as well. Um, so we support, you know, ETL, data preparation workloads, ad hoc query workloads, machine learning, streaming, and, and, and more. And finally, we're optimized for the cloud, right? So we run on AWS and, um, you know, our system of record, just as uh, David mentioned earlier, would be S3, right? And we find that a great way to, to do this. The interesting thing about Cubol is as you use the service, as you use the pl platform, um, the metadata that is generated um, as you're using it is actually captured and we, we make, uh, you know, we start using that to, to then make the, uh, the platform autonomous. That was the next evolution for Cubol. And with that, we, we rolled out something called AIR, uh, which stands for Alerts, Insights, and Recommendations. And we do this at various uh, various levels. So insights would be information that help you understand what's happening under the covers at the infrastructure level, at the platform level, at the application level. Alerts uh, can point you to situations which you might want to investigate further. And then recommendations are um, the output of all of that, uh, which which would then help you become more productive and help you optimize for both performance and cost. Uh, just to give you an idea, you know, we have uh, data discovery, for example, provides recommendations to users, to analysts that are trying to interact with the data, explore the data. Um, you might get uh, suggestions on auto-completing your query based on how your data is being used. You might get social information about uh, data sets, you know, who's querying these tables the most often, um, what are the top queries that are run on this. Uh, that way, if I'm, you know, exploring a new data set, I have 
some information that might help me become a lot more productive and get get to the data insights that I'm that I'm looking for. Additionally, data modeling recommendations, you know, for the data engineering team to figure out if a particular data set is is using the right data format. Should we use a columnar format? Should we partition this differently? You know, all of that stuff is then surfaced back up as well to the data engineering team. And then finally, on the back end, uh, cluster and compute recommendations, right? So the idea there is to provide information back to the admins to help them drive better utilization of the cloud compute resources and also ultimately help uh, improve performance and, and lower cost. Um, again, we're, we're calling this uh, set of features AIR, uh, Alerts, Insights, and Recommendations. Uh, Kibble Cloud Agents. Uh, this is, again, going back to the whole automation of the platform and how this works. So we're building cloud agents, which uh, some of these are already available, um, and these agents then take on common you know, data management tasks, intelligently automate those things to help you, again, be more pr productive, reduce cost, and uh, improve performance. Um, these uh, agents, uh, we have three that are fully available today, and they are, you know, the uh, workload aware auto scaling agent. Um, you know, with the whole separation of compute and storage, one of the great things that uh, you can then do is be able to use compute resources when you need them. So Kubel has built in uh, into, you know, the uh, big data stack, and when I say big data stack, I'm talking about um, Hadoop, Spark, uh, Presto, Hive. You know, we've built in built intelligence into those agents, uh, in, into those engineers with these uh, engines. Sorry, with these agents to help manage the cluster size dynamically. Um, again, adding nodes when we need them, as well as downscaling and and removing nodes when they're no longer needed, all gracefully without affecting in-flight jobs. Uh, this is you know this helps um, drive down the the total cost, um, and again helps improve your operational efficiencies when running this. Um, additionally, on AWS, um, we take advantage of something called uh, AWS Spot Instances. So AWS does something fantastic with their EC2 instances, and there are multiple ways where you can purchase these instances. The excess capacity, things that have not been picked up by on-demand, are then put back out into a, uh, a marketplace where you can bid on EC2 instances um, at you know at a very uh, kind of uh, high discount rate, so pennies on the dollar, and the the great thing with that is you can save, you know, upwards to 80, 90 percent off of what you would do, you know, using on-demand. The trade-off, of course, is that it's a volatile market. You know, sometimes you can get the nodes, um, sometimes you don't get them when you need them, and then the flip, the other aspect is that you can actually lose nodes, um, you know, when you have them. Uh, you know, if somebody is willing to pay more for those nodes at any given point in time. Kubel has built in intelligence into the platform to help you leverage being able to take advantage of spot instances at massive scale and also help mitigate some of the problems that arise from, you know, this being a volatile market. Um, you know, we have, and I'll show you some slides later with some of the savings that our customers are getting off of that. And then the data caching agent, um, this is you got to bridge the gap between the fact that, you know, separation of compute and storage brings a wide number of uh, advantages, right? I think David talked about some of those things. I've, I've touched on some of those things. But, you know, of course, there's some trade-off there with the fact that data has to move, you know, from one, uh, from an object store into the EC2 instances. In the cases where uh, performance is, is important, um, the Kubel data caching agent will help, you know, keep hot sets of data on those EC2 instances as you're, as you're processing the, the data, right? So as you're running out of queries or you're doing exploratory analysis, you know, using Spark or, or notebooks, um, that stuff starts to get uh, cached on a distributed cache on the EC2 instances. As we uh, we're making incremental improvements to our uh, security features as well, that I think is as as most people are aware, that's always going to be an uh, ongoing evolution in terms of security and and, and making that uh, better and better. So some results of this, right? So this is uh, some data we collected over the you know last couple of years, and the spot shopper piece of this, right, when I was talking about being able to uh, save off of uh, the spot, has saved our customers $40 million uh, in, in usage costs. Uh, cluster lifecycle management, and that is the, you know, the fact that we'll dynamically launch these clusters, tear them down if they're idle, uh, has saved our customers $150 million in, in usage costs. And then the workload aware scaling, that's, you know, when you have a cluster up, the ability to dynamically add nodes and remove nodes. Um, has saved our customers $121 million. 
So some really cool stuff there. Really quickly, just to touch on what this all looks like, um, the architecture diagram. So Kubel, uh, the Kubel data service that is the piece at the top there, right? So the access layers, the various ways you can interact with the system. There's a built-in UI, APIs, uh, drivers. The data service orchestration layer, we, we not only host and you know, it's a SaaS, so you know, we, you, out of the box you get the UI and all of the API inter, uh, integrations. But we also orchestrate um, the compute resources. But we do that on the customer's database account, right? So we're launching EC2 instances, you know, in our customers' VPCs. Um, we're not persisting any of the um, customers' data in the Kubel infrastructure at all. All of the data processing and heavy lifting is happening within the customer's environment, um, and that helps us solve um, a great, you know, a, a big. Uh, uh, the, the security checkbox, right? Um, and then the air the piece and the agents piece, right? So some of that stuff runs in line with the cluster. Um, some of that stuff is made it, metadata collection about usage and information about how your how your utilization is, and that turns around and pushes back the the recommendations back um, to the platform. All right, I'm almost done, but before I finish, we've got one more poll question: What big data technology are you using or evaluating today, right? Um, just trying to get an idea for, for the folks that are either exploring or already deployed. You know, are you on premises using um, uh, Hadoop or, or Spark distribution, uh, something like Cloudera, Hortonworks? Are you in AWS using Elastic MapReduce? Uh, are you using, you know, one of the distribution guys on the cloud um, using something like Databricks or something else? Um, or are you in a state where you're evaluating all of these deployments? So just curious about that aspect. That'd be great to know. Cool. Okay. So I'm looking at uh, the, some of the results, and I'm seeing a uh, big chunk are using Elastic MapReduce, which is great. So you're already on AWS, and then I see, um, you know, less than 10% or so using Cloudera, where it works on the cloud, and then I see about 10% of you using, um, you know, something on premises, and then uh, then there's a uh, majority of you are evaluating cloud deployment options. Which is great, and hopefully, you know, this webinar is going to help you um, with with helping you make some of those decisions. All right, YTubel, right? Um, so again, it is a, a single platform for everything. I know that sounds a little crazy, but you know, everything here is is the big data platform, right? Um, we are cloud optimized, right? We work uh, great, and we've taken you know not just uh, vanilla, but we've taken you know open source versions of, of all of these products, and we offer them up to our customers and optimize that to run well in the cloud. Uh, we automate, right? So the idea here is let's make it easier, right? Let's help our customers drive down total cost, but also help you know speed up time to value, and and that's why you all. Awesome. I will take the opportunity to say thanks again, and then pass it over uh, to Seth. All right, great, thanks. So yeah, my name is Seth Myers. I'm a senior data scientist here at Demandbase. And basically what I'll be talking about today is how Demandbase is able to build kind of an enterprise level uh, machine learning driven tool uh, completely on Kubel and AWS. And there's a lot of challenges that uh, arose from that um, and that uh, we, were, we wouldn't have been able to solve without a Kubel AWS uh, platform like we have. All right, so who is Demandbase? Um, we are a, a marketing automation company, particularly a uh, business to business marketing uh, automation company and basically what we do is we use um, artificial intelligence machine learning to automate different aspects of how one company will advertise or sell or market to another company when, when, when one business is trying to sell into another business or market to another business the very first question they have to answer is is which businesses should they target um, we call those businesses that you target we call those accounts and so basically the, the we needed to build a tool for, for our clients, it basically can um, tell them which companies should they be targeting um, with, with marketing and advertising and selling. This is a pretty tough problem uh, to solve because you know, no two companies are alike, and a lot of factors go into whether or not a company will, will buy your product. You know, there's questions like, do they have a budget for your product? Are, are, um, you know, are they the right fit based on the type of business they do? Are they currently in market for your product? That basically means, are they, you know, evaluating your product. Are they are they shopping around? Are they looking at your competitors? And also, do they have the right people? Do they have decision makers at that company that you know have the authority and the interest in, in buying your product and, and you know in, in signing the contract? So all those kind of to determine um, 
if an account is right for our, our clients to be targeting, and they're very tough questions to answer. Uh, the way we had to answer these questions is by using many types of very large data sets, and then um, once they have those data sets, to figure out ways to run machine, machine learning on them to actually figure out, find the right accounts. Um, the Mayvase had a previous solution that was able to kind of take all these different factors, um, use machine learning to find these right accounts, but it took multiple days to run. And that was a huge challenge for our clients because, you know, getting this to work right for them, you know, it takes some iteration. They have to say, okay, well, what if I twist this knob? What if I change this parameter? I want to see if my results, you know, how they improve. And so that kind of iteration became very difficult if each time they press the button took multiple days. So we basically decided we need to come up with a, a much faster solution that could answer to all these questions um, in a way that they could iterate on quickly. To get a little more into the nuts and bolts of this, uh, to each of these questions I've talked about before about, you know, is there a need for the product? Are they in market? Um, do they have the right people? I kind of want to go into a little more detail about the data sets we use to answer each question. So for the, for the, to determine if an account um, has a need for their product, uh, we basically have a data set of about 14 million possible accounts that we're tracking at any point in time. And we know firmographic information about them, about their, like their revenue, the number of employees, where they're located, the industry that they're in, that kind of stuff. And we also have a knowledge graph um, that we built through natural language processing engine, crawling the World Wide Web and finding everything you can about each of these accounts and figuring out how these accounts are all connected and putting that into a kind of a structured graph. Uh, to determine if an account is in market, each year we're tracking about 700 billion web interactions and Demandbase has uh, intellectual property that can take a web interaction and map it back to an account so we'll say, okay, this account is doing something interesting uh, on, online. And from those interactions, we're able to say, okay, this account is currently shopping around for a, some, some product. But the key point here is to say that that's across 700 billion web interactions that we need to mine through. Um, and then lastly, to identify the right people, to identify the decision makers, we have a database of about uh, 100 million employees across all of, all of these accounts that we're currently tracking you know, reading about what they're, what they're being discussing online, their job titles, their, their contact information, all of that. So I want to kind of give you guys like a, a quick screenshot of what the product actually looks like so you can get a feel for what we're, the problem we're actually solving here. So um, a domain-based customer, uh, this is what they would see when they log in. So the machine learning has already cranked and they basically said, okay, here are 5,000 accounts that you should be targeting for various reasons. And so we kind of display it here in this UI and you can see, here that you know the, the machine learning is saying that McKinsey and Company, C Technologies, and four are the top three accounts that this client should be selling to, and those uh, these accounts, these 5,000 accounts, are chosen from a set of uh, 14 million accounts. So that basically means that our machine learning model has to look at each of these 14 million accounts beforehand and make decisions about if it's the right account or not. As I mentioned before, we're tracking these 700 billion web interactions, and we extract keywords from each of these web interactions. So these are basically things that you know, McKinsey and Company or CA Technologies, these are things that they are reading online that's relevant to what our customer is trying to sell them. So this is kind of a way to tell, to tell our client that, hey, they're shopping for your product, hey, they're in market. And lastly, we keep track, uh, at each account, we're tracking the people that actually are going to be the right fit, the people you should actually be talking to. And so that comes from that set of 100 million contacts. So this is just kind of give you guys a feel for what this actually product uh, looks like and how we use these, these large data sets to generate these insights. The solution of how we solve this issue of making this faster iteration um, is basically what our, what, our, what our product does now is a user has the ability to press a button. So our client can log in, they can say, all right, generate my set of accounts. Um, we spin up uh, 60 EC2 servers on AWS uh, through Kubel, and uh, once those, those servers are running, we deploy a machine learning algorithm uh, built on Spark and MLib. MLib is the is a machine learning library built on top of Spark. Um, and then for each of these 14 million accounts, we, you know, we basically model their, uh, their web interactions, who their buyers are, online content, their firmographic information, all that's plugged into the machine learning model that scores each account. And then we take the, the top 5,000 accounts that are scored the highest, and we deliver those to the web app that you just saw. Um, and we're able to do all of this in 20 minutes. Uh, now, before I go on, I just want to kind of, you know, point out the obvious here that there's a lot of moving pieces to this. There's a lot of different things that have to work well. And the fact this is, you know, enterprise level solution and it's also customer facing, it has to work with a high level of certainty. So this would actually be normally a nightmare for our developer operations team to figure out how to make all these, uh, how these 
parts uh, to work reliably. Um, but because uh, we, we built this on top of Kubel, um, our basically our DevOps don't has, doesn't have to do anything. They they are completely hands off from the solution. It's all uh, taken care of uh, by Kubel. Kubel makes this possible. So basically, Kubel manages all our different EC2 instances, and uh, it's the point now that we've actually done stress tests on this thing. So we had you know 20 different clients run each of these models, so each client spinning up 60 EC2 servers. So we're talking about more than a thousand EC2 servers running. Uh, Concurrently, I'm sorry, uh, at the same time, crunching all this data, and it was able to do that without without any problems. Um, Kubel also helps us keep our costs down. So Manesh mentioned before how like this kind of spot bidding uh, technology that uh, AWS and Kubel do. The fact that we can optimize our spot bidding prices, the fact that we can balance between spot prices versus on-demand servers means we're never at risk of losing the server completely, and uh, that basically allows us to keep our costs down. Um, Kubel also has this great feature that basically allows us to uh, kind of do these heterogeneous server clusters. So we basically can tell them, okay, how much compute we need, how much memory we need, and they basically figure out the rest. They figure out, you know, the most cost-effective ways to, and, and what types of EC2 servers should we be using, and they basically take care of, uh, they, they basically make sure those servers are available in a way that's cost-effective. Um, on top of this, uh, Kubel has uh, an API that we, uh, that we can build on top of. So we basically built an a, a play API that when the customer clicks the button, we simply just call, uh, we just ping, you know, Kubel's endpoint, and immediately the 60 servers are spun up, and our, our Spark job is deployed, and um, within 20 minutes, um, we, we have our answer, and we have a, 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 our insights to show the customer. Um, we don't have to worry, like I said before, our developer uh, operations team is completely hands-off here. Um, Kubel takes care of all the infra infrastructure, uh, and so that allows us to actually focus on, you know, developing machine learning, making sure the, the, the science uh, is at its best, and because that's basically where demand base can have the most value, instead of worrying about you know de DevOps trying to manage all these smart clusters. And in general, I mean, basically, Kubel allowed us to build kind of this self-service machine learning solution, which uh, like it was very difficult, lots of moving pieces, and we certainly couldn't have done uh, without Kubel and AWS. All right, great. So I'm going to hand things back over to David, but uh, yeah, really appreciate you guys uh, hearing about our story, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Great, thanks for that, Seth. Uh, really interesting story and um, generated uh, the, the, some interesting um, Q&A uh, that we'll jump into in just a few minutes. For next steps, um, you know, and if you want to dig a little deeper on some of these solutions, there's landing pages for Kubel and demand base. AWS has a, um, a free tier um, that you can get started with, uh, and it's, you know, it's literally uh, free as in beer. And if you're interested in um, taking a look at Kubel uh, and kicking the tires and maybe doing a proof of concept, we have a, uh, a quick start, which is basically a production ready uh, cloud formation template that um, that will let you roll it out uh, with just a few clicks. Um, you can also buy the product on AWS Marketplace. And um, uh, if you haven't checked out Marketplace, you probably should. It's a great way to uh, acquire software and um, uh, you know, take advantage of uh, hourly pricing as well as um, bringing your own license, you know, if you want to do it for a year and potentially um, uh, get a better discount on that. And, you know, you pay for pay for what you use, right? You know, that's something that um, we believe in very fervently um, at AWS. So uh, definitely take a look at these links. Um, uh, no need to screenshot them uh, since you'll have access to the presentation. So. Uh, the the next thing I wanted to do um, was to jump into um, Q and A. Uh, one of the the, the more um, uh, interesting questions that that I received um, uh, was really um, I had a couple of questions about Kubel, a couple of questions about demand base. I'm going to start with some of the Kubel questions. So uh, Manesh, um, you, you're you're on the line first. Um, so. Uh, Really, I, I got a couple of variations to this question. Um, you know, what's different about Kubel versus other big data solutions that I can run on AWS? Like, like what really makes it stand out? Sure. Um, yeah, that kind of question comes up a, a lot, even in the field, right? When we're talking to customers, um, and I think what what really makes it stand out is is you know some of the the, the fact that we've really put together an end to end platform. Um, that caters to multiple persona. Um, just to kind of, you know, just just highlighting that, um, you know, can you can you do something like Kubel, um, you know, with some of the tools that are available already, 
you know, on AWS, for example, take Elastic MapReduce. And I think, uh, technically speaking, you can kind of get there. The, the, the big thing that we, where we add value is we make it all easy. We built the automation aspects into, you know, the core stacks themselves. All right, so scaling up and scaling down. Um, there's a lot that goes to that, for example, just the scaling piece um, with, you know, looking at various um, internal, you know, it's not it's not an external uh, kind of piece of software that's looking at um, CPU usage and things like that. What we're doing is we've actually added intelligence into, you know, Yarn, for example, um, or Spark, right? And based on that, we're able to, you know, dynamically scale up and scale down a lot easier and a lot more efficiently uh, without any sort of human intervention. Um, and also the configuration of this stuff is quite straightforward. It's, you know, minimum number of nodes and maximum number of nodes. And certainly you can override some of the way the, the default behavior is, but the thresholding, this decision making, all that stuff is kind of baked into it. If that's just on the cluster management piece, then, you know, the whole stack is available out of the box, right? The, the native kind of first class notebooks and UI integration and API and authentication, you know, so yeah, just to kind of, yeah, I mean, I, I think it just makes it uh, an end-to-end -end platform, which is a lot easier to use and helps um, any organization roll it out to a large number of variety kind of uh, use cases and users. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I would say, you know, if that, if for me, I think, you know, having worked with the product, um, there's two things that really stand out for me. Um, you know, back when I was a private citizen, uh, I, I ran a DevOps team and uh, we were always overloaded. So uh, there were a lot of cool tools out there that um, just required, you know, six weeks of the, the DevOps team to implement. Um, and, you know, the, then at some point, you know, it would be profit. But, you know, what I really liked about this particular tool is that it didn't put any more load on my DevOps team. You know, it, it really was, you know, kind of click, click, go, um, and all about kind of simplifying the process. And the other, like, really cool thing that you can kind of take away is that Kubel can actually help you cut the processing costs. So, you know, the, it, it, as you go back over the deck, um, take a look at that area around Spot Shopper. Um, that, there's actually some serious money to be saved there. Um, so kind of those two things together was really exciting to me. So uh, thanks for that, Manesh. Um, yeah. And then uh, a, a question for you, Seth. One of the uh, viewers asked us, so does demand base have some of that data already available, or are you collecting and processing both within that 20 minutes? Ah, oh, right. That's a great question. So uh, we basically have a series of backend jobs. Um, so, for example, processing of the 700 billion web interactions or all the different intelligence we have to build on top of those 14 million uh, accounts we're currently tracking, those are uh, jobs that are done in the back end as part of the nightly build or sometimes, uh, you know, weekly build. Um, and those, those, those also, those builds also run uh, in Kubel, but they're done asynchronously um, from the, you know, the actual 20 minutes that uh, when the customer presses the button. So basically what we do is we take those 700 billion web interactions, and we distill them down into you know something that's easily queryable uh, and digestible in that, that we can run in that, same, uh, in that 20 minutes. Great, thanks for that, Seth. The questions we get from the, the attendees of these webinars are, are frankly awesome. Um, so uh, keep them coming. I've got a few more minutes for Q and A here. Um, but uh, so question for Cubo, um, uh, for Manesh. Um, uh, you touched on this a little bit, um, but could you give us a little more detail on shared notebooks? Um, is this something that we could use um, across teams? Um, uh, and the, the question behind the question is they have a specific use case about um, using that to facilitate community contribution approaches. Uh, yeah, certainly. So the notebooks you know, we uh, are, again, out of, uh, available out of the box, right? So if you're familiar with notebook technologies, for use with you know uh, data exploration and, and data science, um, you know we have we have something built into the product, and you know that's primarily used with uh, Spark, um, but we support them with Presto and Hive as well. But in terms of sharing and how that works, um, yeah, it's designed for multi-user um, access, and you can you know do things like uh, organize your notebooks, but also um, put uh, controls around them, like who can who can access them and who can read them and run them, and therefore allow you to share and collaborate. Uh, additionally, you know you're you're using the notebook, developing stuff, um, visualizing stuff, exploring your data, 
typically if you're an analyst, a data scientist, maybe even an engineer. However, if you're a business user, you might want to consume you know, what the output of that. And so there's a way in QBall where you can actually take a notebook and publish uh, a dashboard. And that dashboard could then be consumed by a class of users that don't necessarily need to um, you know, know anything about the underlying code or, or SQL that's being executed. But just want to be able to, you know, either it's interactively run, you know, the, the different paragraphs of the notebook, so it becomes a dashboard, and you can kind of, you know, run a report, if you will, if you're, you know, let's say, uh, a sales executive or or a manager, and you want to kind of just be able to um, go and look up your, you know, how things are going. You can make them interactive as well by allowing your users to, to plug in dynamic values, um, and yeah, and I think what happens in that case is that each each user then gets their own sort of um, context under the hood for those of you that might be familiar with uh, how Spark and Notebooks work. Um, when you interact with it, you're kind of working against a single sort of application, which is what makes it fast. Um, and then if you're a distinct user, we'll fire up a, a separate, um, you know, application context for that to avoid people um, stepping on each other's toes. Additionally, I, I think this is available all in the Quick Start. So if you wanted to take a look at that, um, the Quick Start link that uh, David posted on the slide before. Uh, definitely uh, have a look at that. You can actually uh, jump in and, and start playing with those notebooks. Cool. And I think uh, uh, Seth had a little bit of uh, uh, love for notebooks too that he wanted to throw in. Oh, absolutely. Like demand base, we we use that. We use notebooks all the time, and uh, we basically have about um, a team up to about twenty now or so, uh, split between data scientists and data engineers, and. Basically, kind of our workflow has been data scientists, you know, will spin up a Spark cluster with a notebook attached to it, and we start running experiments. We start building machine learning models. We start analyzing the data. And as we kind of, you know, hone in and make our models more and more mature, uh, basically the way we productize it is we'll basically commit the notebook to GitHub and then send that link to a data engineer and other engineers, and then we actually work with them, and we start turning that into a production-level uh, product. And that's basically how we build account selection, the tool I just described, and uh, we've also built other machine learning tools uh, on, on Cube as well. And basically the notebooks are kind of the way we communicate uh, as a team. We, we, we pass notebooks back and forth to each other all the time. We iterate, like I said, the way I, the way we productionalize a machine learning once we're, once we finalized it is we basically do that through notebooks. So it, it's really the notebook feature alone and how easily, how well it's integrated with Cubal has made our development time um, as we build these machine learning tools, it just it's dramatically reduced our development time. So yeah, we absolutely love uh, that feature at demand base. Great. Thanks for that, Seth. Cool. Um, so I had a question, and um, we're just about out of question time here. Um, so, uh, and, and stay with me. Um, I, I'd actually like both of you guys to kind of weigh in on this. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a complicated ask. So the, the question is, um, data from different data sets often uh, do not share common keys for, you know, making, uh, joining the data, like, super convenient, right? And the question says, you know, there's usually a way to figure out these keys and relationships, but it can require some pretty complex processing and manipulation before you can merge that data across sources. Um, do are we doing any of this processing, manipulation, uh, and potential um, deduping in some of these examples, or is that more of an advanced use case? So, uh, speaking to our case of, you know, we have we have data from many different types of sources. Uh, we actually have uh, an entire team of people who basically their job is to attribute these different web interactions, these these buyers, these this photographic information to a single unifying key that's a, a, of an account across different different data sets. We basically rely on uh, the domain of the website of, of an account. Um, that's how we're able to join against you know the photographic information, against the web interactions, against the buyers. Um, a lot of it, it's a very hard problem to do from a data standpoint, and that's why we have a team of data engineers and data scientists that work on that. But uh, that's all done in kind of the back end, and, and all the data sets I just described, we basically keep them um, in a columnar store uh, in, in Parquet, um, and then when the, the the job actually spins up, we just join uh, in Spark against that domain key that's unique across all the different accounts. Yeah, I, I mean that's certainly a common problem, and I think. The way Seth uh, described the, the way uh, demand-based approaches it, it is um, something similar to that, right? I think we've seen customers um, do, doing similar things. You know, I think our hope there is that the tooling that we we can give you with uh, again the notebooks and the UI and the capabilities of being able to 
you know, uh, easily explore the data sets will make you coming to that solution a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that's, uh, that a lot of our customers are doing. Great, thanks guys. Um, uh, thanks for the insight on that. Um, so I, I had one last question, and this is for you, Seth. Give me a sense of like kind of your team scale. So, um, how many users do you support, and how big is your your data science team? You know, the folks getting the big bugs. Sure. So uh, I don't even know the specific, uh, the exact number right now. Um, I think it's somewhere between uh, fifteen and twenty, and we've been we've been hiring quite aggressively and so we you know each month we're adding new users to uh to Cubal. um but yeah i would say we have about um about seven or so data scientists and, and the rest of the team um are data engineers um and you know as I mentioned before this is actually the second uh machine learning product we built on top of Cubal, um and all these different data engineering tasks that I've alluded to all of that's managed on Cubal. and so every time we bring on a, a data engineer they're usually up and running on Cubal. I mean, the first day they're they're starting to run Spark jobs, uh, and that's kind of one of the things that really attracted us to Cubal is like how quickly we can get a new employee onboarded and actually creating value on Cubal. And and so yeah, uh, we, we're at 15 to 20 people right now. Um, we're, we continue to hire aggressively, and so we foresee very continued ease of use as we bring more and more uh, people onto Cubal. As we're based in uh, Soma in San Francisco, if anybody's looking for a job, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Please send resumes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, weather's great here this time of year too, um, everybody. So um, thanks, thanks for that. So question for you, Manesh, and we'll probably have to uh, bounce after the next one or two. But what about connecting Cubal to like other reporting tools? Like say that I had um, something like Tableau or Looker. Um, do you guys integrate with those tools or is it kind of an either or situation? No, yeah, absolutely. No, we, um, it, you know, the generic answer to that is we have drivers, right? So JDBC, ODBC, um, you know, with uh, with Looker, um, we have a kind of a partnership, and they've got us in the drop down. Um, we have a lot of customers using Tableau with our ODBC driver, um, and then there's you know a plethora of other other tools out there, BI tools, um, including you know uh, things like Power BI as well. But you know, just yeah, I mean, we integrate with those tools and. So Cubal doesn't necessarily provide um, BI level visualization, you know, outside of what's in the, you know, available to you to do in the notebooks, um, and so therefore these drivers really make it uh, a good way for our customers to pick the, the tool that makes the most sense for them. Okay, great. Um, and uh, one last question, and then we'll have to run, and we're almost out of time. But um, this question's for you, Seth, um, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But you know, uh, I, I think the the intent of the question was um, that you've been able to do things kind of much faster, you know, with this solution um, engaged. And maybe what are kind of the the top one or two things that have really contributed to that faster pace of being able to um, solve problems for customers? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. So. Uh, in terms of just the physics of what of what we're doing, um, the fact that we can uh, dynamically spin up, you know, 60 EC2 instances, and then you know, then then not worry. Like as soon as the Spark job is done, they they turn off. The fact that we're able to do that um, in a way that's you know highly reliable. Um, you know, we don't have to have you know some some poor DevOps guy in the background pressing all the buttons, making sure that things don't go down. The fact because our previous solution was just like a single high you know high memory EC2 instance because we were worried about too many moving parts. Uh, but when we moved on to Cubal, we basically can have these 60 EC2 instances and instead of doing one EC2 we can have you know uh, hundreds of hundreds of cores. And so that was definitely the first piece that made all this possible. And then the second one in general is that as we started integrating these more and more of these data sources, the the development time uh, to actually build these models and build the machine learning just uh, really, really um, sped up. Um, we were able to get to, we were able to solve problems much quicker, uh, largely through kind of that net, that notebook workflow I alluded to before. But yeah, I would say the fact that it's very easy to onboard a new employee and, and for them to start running experiments, and the fact that we can not worry about a huge cluster of servers that can do the computation we need, those are the, really the big pieces that allowed us to do this. Awesome, and you know, that is the, uh, the joy and promise of parallel processing, right? You know, I can Absolutely. use one server for a hundred minutes or a hundred servers for one minute. You know, and, and um, when when you're paying the same price for either, uh, it, it really is a game changer. 
And for those of you folks, uh, I think it was 52% uh, that are evaluating cloud deployment options. Uh, you know, if you're writing stuff down in your notebook, that is a big thing to underline. Um, you know, that um, with a modern processing framework, um, you can actually, you know, do things much, much, much faster for the same price or even less. You know, if you use a tool like Spot Shopper, um, you may find that uh, you can save money, right? Generally, uh, it's pretty hard to get fired um, when you're saving the company money, so it's good career insurance too. So thanks everybody. A big thanks to, to Seth um, for showing, you know, how they did it. Big thanks to Manash um, for sharing the Cubal story. Um, and uh, an absolutely massive thanks to all of you for attending and giving us your most valuable thing, which is your time. Thank you for that. And have a great rest of your day.